Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Erin Kinnan. I'm the Vice President for Civic Engagement at Bard College. Um, and I'm one of the um, organizers for uh, the uh, Scholars Program that is a partnership between the uh, Telwar Network um, and the Open Society University Network. And I believe we're in our third year. Um, we uh, uh, have scholars from around the globe uh, representing a wide range of disciplines that meet together over the course of about five months to share reflections, challenges, and ideas related to their engaged scholarship. Um, we cross geopolitical boundaries um, and um, support the amazing work where scholars are, are collaborating with community partners to develop new knowledge um, and to strengthen lasting ties between researchers and communities um, in which they're collaborating. Um, so we're excited for our workshop today, and I'm going to turn it over um, to the folks um, who are um, leading us um, through their process today. Uh, it's led by one of the participating scholars, uh, Diana Ordonez Castillo of University de Los Andes. She's joined by her colleagues um, here, and they're exploring questions related to the potential of museums and institutions that are dedicated to memory to realize their potential as platforms for citizen engagement, and also considering ways to build bridges among themselves to strengthen their roles as tools for the transformation of society. Um, so I'm gonna turn the floor over to Diana to explain more about her work and just welcome you all to today's talk. Hi Erin, hi everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. So I'm going to give the floor to Alexander Herrera, who is the co-PI co of my project, um, because he has a little class to <laughs> um, to attend. So please, Alexander. Thank you, everybody. We're switching to Spanish, and we welcome you to this virtual uh, session on engaged research, museums for peace, networking for social transformation, an invitation from Colombia. Basically, what we are going to do today is to uh, share a, an outstanding panel. Uh, we hope we can have Luis Carlos Manjarres from the program for the strengthening of museums. We are also going to welcome very especially Italia. I saw her around Italia, Samudio, Nidia Gutierrez, and Camilo Murcia from the Colombian Alliance of Museums. And from London and New York, we are going to have Jen Burr and Anne Chan. It's a pleasure for us to have this research project that started very small around three years ago, or four years actually, with the support of the School of Arts and Humanities at the University of Los Andes and the Colombian German Center for Peace, CAPAS. And to see how it's grown, I see we have 163 people in different parts of the world trying to see what we are doing. So we are really proud of that. So we'll start uh, focusing on the celebration of the death and memories at a small symposium. And since then, we've learned a lot because perhaps we dedicated several days amid the pandemic restrictions to break down with disciplinary barriers, to break down with the barriers that separate us. Separate us. And it was very uh, a very right decision to invite those that worked for peace in Colombia mainly women, as you say here, that are very strong and that challenged us uh, scholars and forced us to do away with several ideas we had, for instance, around museology, museography, studies for development, studies for memory, peace, and starting creating different links, links around memory and also, of course, around uh, affections. Uh, special greeting to from our small project to the colleagues from the National Museum of Colombia, a great museum. 
that uh, commissioned us with the coordination of a series of uh, talks at the National Museum last year around the exhibition El Mochuelo, also the movie library that provided an exhibition of films at the Montes de Maria, also the uh, Moving Museum of Memory, that was they were one of the first partners of our project together with the popular female organization and the uh, women from Tupumayo. So greetings to all of them there in Barraca and Moco. I hope they are around. We also made a small exhibition of Museums for Peace, the Social Life of Death here in Bogota at the University of Ward at the University of Bonn. If there's anybody from Germany here, that's the Uni Bonn for all of us. And that's when we started with our first uh, virtual session. I don't know, um, the, the webinar uh, had already been coined in, in Spanish as a word. We held our first webinar on the Day for Peace here at the University of Los Andes. Today's dialogue with Anne and Jen, Luis Carlos, Italia, Nidia, Camilo, will be led, of course, by Diana Ordóñez. And this is possible thanks to the support of the Open Society University Network and the Ipar College and the Bard College and the Colombian Alliance of Museums. To each and every one of you that lead or think of a museum initiative in Colombia, technological, archaeological museums, this space is particularly targeting you. Thank you so much for your attention. And Diana, go ahead, please. Thank you, Alex. So as Alexander mentioned, this is already our fourth uh, stage of the project. And the invitation for you today is to reflect upon how we can strengthen the ties in a sector that has been fragmented and has been characterized by centralization in Colombia and in Bogota as the capital of the country. So the first question, or the question that started this webinar is basically how many we are, where we are, what we are doing, uh, what things bring us together, how we can strengthen the, the ties to create a stronger community that uh, can do advocacy on the country decisions and as tools for social transformation. So for today's conversation, we have initiatives from Colombia, we have the National Museum represented by Camilo Murcia, also Ingrid, I saw her around, Luis Carlos Mangares, that also part of the program for strengthening museums, they are the leaders of the sector in the country, and also the Colombian Alliance of Museums with Italia Samudio. I'm not sure Nidia is here today. And we also have professors uh, Jennifer and Anne, as uh, Alex mentioned, that we invited to be moderators or interlocutors in this uh, session to analyze the situation between the Colombian case and uh, the US. So I'm going to introduce Jen and Anne. Jennifer Bird is a professor of archaeology at the Burbank College at the at London University, and Professor Anne Shen is at the Bards College, and they both work at a project called Life in Ruins. So with this project, the professors investigate the needs of those that work uh, with heritage in Syria that despite the conflict are still doing their best to protect museums, to protect the heritage, to monitor archaeological sites. Although it's true that the conflict in Syria is one of the recent layers in the um, international mindset, we should remember that Syria is one of the most important civilizations of humanity, the Persian uh, civilization. So we have invited Jen and Anne for that, uh, for them to give them their perspective in that respect. So perhaps if you can greet us first. 
thank you so much for having us here, Diana, today. And it's such a, we're just at the, at the start of our project. So it's such a pleasure to hear about um, your work and a real honor to be here to be able to speak with you uh, about it today. So I'm just really looking forward to, to hearing more. Um, and how's your echo? I'm gonna try it this way. Um, <laughs> so you can see that I, I have my class along for the ride this morning uh, from Annandale, New York. And thank you so much for uh, the invitation to, to join and to, to learn from you. Uh, I think that there's a lot of things that, that Jen and I are thinking about that uh, are particular to the Syrian case, but uh, that um, uh, can be in conversation with, with uh, uh, colleagues elsewhere. And so we're, we're excited to learn from your experience as well. Thank you so much. And I'm not sure whether the rest is here. I would like to introduce also Italia. Italia, perhaps, if you can send us, say hello, or Camilo. Hello, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. We are so happy from the Colombian Alliance for Museums to be here with you and to resonate the political voice of museums here in Colombia. That's a struggle that we've been leading for some years now. And of course, also from the territories, the Itinerating Museum for Memory and the Identity of the Regions. Thank you. Juan Camilo, are you there? Yes, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, for us, this has been a very long process of reflection on museums for memory and their representation, two important topics in Colombia and from the Alliance and in the different areas where I have participated and also now at the Colombian, at the National Museum of Colombia, we are discussing that. Thank you for the invitation. Luis Carlos or Ingrid. Good morning, everyone. I'm Luis Manjarez, coordinator of the program for strengthening museums at the National Museum of Colombia. We are very happy to be here with you today. And uh, we're going to share some topics that we've been discovering since we um, started our management of the strengthening program. In Colombia, there are 437 museums throughout the country. And the peripheries of the country is quite neglected. There are not many museums there. And of these 457 museums, we still have 133 museums we have not contacted yet. That reveals the difficulty of the territory in Colombia. And it reveals uh, the difficulties with connectivity and the diversity of the museum universe in this country. And I think the project that we've been working on at Museums for Peace will allow us to make a diagnosis, to contact them, and to recognize the work that many people do at the territories of difficult access. So thank you all for this space and for the project itself and for the contributions and comments you may make today. Thank you, Diana, for the invitation. I remind our speakers and our guests as well that this session is being translated. It's been interpreted simultaneously. So uh, if, remember not to speak too fast to facilitate the work of the interpreters. I would like to introduce uh, the seminar to give you some context. One of the efforts that is part of this exercise that this webinar is part of is how to strengthen a community that has a huge potential for social transformation and for citizen engagement. However, despite we recognize ourselves as tools for social change and for transformation and for justice and the construction for peace, we still do not have a strong unified community or we don't even know how large our community is actually. And the exercise of this webinar 
And the exercise we are engaged in today is the first step to say, well, Colombia has um, adopted this direction, has made these achievements, and this is the, their horizon. And first, we would like to share our experience in Colombia, but we would also like to listen to other cases, what is happening in other parts of the world. So the first question to our speakers, to our guests, is what do you think are those opportunities and challenges currently for the museum sector in in this path that we have adopted? What is it that we've done correctly? What is it that we are lacking? What are the, the most difficult uh, challenges? Oh, Nidia is here. Hi, how are you? She's an architect. Good morning, Nidia. Good morning, everyone. Nidia is also part of the Colombian Alliance for Museums, and she's one of the professors at the master's course on museology and heritage at the National Museum here in Colombia. The master's course is part of the of one of the most important efforts for professionalizing the sector. It's the only master's course in Colombia. And actually, it's the academic part the, the strongest academic part, a branch of Colombia that is strongly related to the efforts at the community level. And that effort has been part of the strength, not only of the master's course, but also of the growth of the sector in Colombia. So I would like to pass the floor to Italia to answer the question about our current challenges and opportunities. Thank you. We have lots of challenges ahead, but I think that thanks to a joint effort and at the museum's initiative, not necessarily a government initiative, we've been getting together and creating some roadmaps so as to reach those places where um, the, the, we need cultural uh, state policies as to the cultural model. Now we have to um, make citizens understand the role of museums in Colombia, how to make the communities in all the territories understand that we are spaces for dialogue, for citizen dialogue, for citizen reflection, for the construction of community alternatives, for the uh, careful listening and to speak with a citizen voice that gives a political dimension to those cultural expressions in all the territories. Unfortunately, in Colombia, and despite we have a more progressive administration than in, in previous administrations, perhaps this is the first government of that characteristic, but in the cultural sector and the museum sector specifically, unfortunately, is not properly understood as a space for creation, for construction, for citizen exercise. And in the case of the Colombian context, uh, as a solution for a context of violence, we need a more fluent communication to uh, with our society. We need strategic communication strategies to tell citizens and the governments that we are ready, we are prepared, and we take on the challenge of becoming those safe places that violence has deprived us of, those safe places to have difficult conversations we need to have as a country. And that challenge can be taken on jointly all together if we combine efforts. In Colombia, there are many initiatives, many small initiatives or some large initiatives, such as the initiative of the National Museum that have understood this task. So we need to get together based on clear roadmaps to have a direct dialogue with the governments, with the establishment, but also that are able to sit and listen to the citizens with a deep respect, with a careful listening, and with 
the ability to have a horizontal dialogue, a fertile and creative dialogue, so that we can turn what is our Achilles heel, that is an approach to museums as an exhibition place, into citizen practices and participative uh, strategies like the community curatorships with a political and transformational characteristic. We know museums have that potential. We have the capabilities, we have the will, we just need to speak more clearly, to listen to the citizens and also to resonate all these conversations that as a country we need to have and we need to strengthen. Thank you, Italia. Now I would like to listen to Luis Carlos. Are you there? Or perhaps Professor Nidia, now that she has joined. It's okay. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Let me begin by ratifying what Ita has just said. I would like to emphasize that we made efforts, though we haven't yet had uh, achievements, but we have made some progress to have a museum policy supported by a law on museums. That is um, the result of the effort invested by the Alliance of Museums uh, as a whole. But, uh, in, yet, we cannot say that we have succeeded. We need to pass a law on museums, a law that is consistent with all the interests mentioned by Italia. That is what I believe that has happened so far. Now, the biggest challenge, in my opinion, is uh, something that m confuses me. Why? If Colombia has uh, e extraordinarily achieved a special justice for peace uh, with the National Memorial Center, where the Memorial Museum should have been opened, a museum that has a central role. If Colombia has succeeded in establishing the structure that, that is now paralyzed because it is just standing there, we need to do something to uh, and block that situation. How is it possible to have a building in that state of repair in Colombia? Millions of Colombian pesos have been invested and the building is just standing there in a deteriorated condition. So I think that that museum, the Museum of Memory, should become a reality. Now it seems that there are seven directors that were appointed over the course of two years. Uh, I think that they are going through a very deep institutional crisis. So now we are starting to see some improvements. I'm glad to hear that a new person has been appointed. I can't remember the name, but that is uh, a big hole, a big gap in the peacemaking uh, uh, process where these kind of institutions play a, a fundamental role. Let me give some context to the audience who are not from Colombia. Colombia. Colombia has been in an internal armed conflict for eight decades almost. And in 2016, during the Santos administration and an agreement was established with the oldest guerrilla movement in Colombia. And thanks to that agreement, a big process started. There was some initial memory building process, so this became more consolidated 
It was a process telling about the resistance of the citizens, uh, the violent situations, the organization of communities to resist the violence and to um, deal with inequalities and injustices. So Professor Nidia is trying to say that part of that accord, part of that agreement led to the consolidation of a transition system, a system that consists of three big pillars, the, the special judiciary system for peace, that is a transitional system, uh, a unit devoted to uh, the search of disappeared people, and then the Commission on Truth. The Commission on Truth and the transitional judiciary system are the most visible components, but the Memorial Center and other memory-related initiatives are associated also to that system. The museum media is referring to is a direct result of that agreement. Um, right now, it is just a building that was erected there. It has some uh, structural faults. Um, it has been abandoned. It, it doesn't serve a museological purpose. It is just standing there. So despite the fact that Colombia has uh, made a long way on um, memory policies and making sure that memory is the centerpiece of the peace building process. We have some gaps like this museum that is distrust in the museum and even uh, a lack of civic engagement with the museum so that the museum can serve its true purpose. So I would like to give the floor to Camilo who works in this kind of institution. Hello. Right now, I believe there is an interesting but quiet or silent record of the need to have a conversation between community and citizens initiatives and these highly institutionalized voices that seem to be anchored in the government uh, residing in Bogota. So, as Diana said, um, there are some parties working in the Commission on Truth, and they did quite an interesting piece of work. Uh, in their own way, they were able to present uh, a full exercise on history in a short period of time, but it was a critical exercise, quite interesting, and this has turned into a product, into an output. Um, the output has been some giant books. Um, there was a commitment to uh, bring all this information to the Museum of Memory in the center of the capital city in Bogota, and some digital materials. The Commission finished its work a year and a half ago, but we still don't have that materialized because and they mm, became distant from the work on memory and the museum. And then there are gaps, there are some uh, vacuum space, uh, empty spaces that nobody is taking care of right now in Bogota. So I think that that is one of the most important challenges ahead of us. So we have a special justice system for peace. We have the Museum of Memory, where we will have the uh, perpetrators, uh, the, the should be reflected there. There should be a plaque or something representing that part of our history, but the museum has not yet succeeded in uh, gaining meaning or materializing that. Uh, and it is it is the justice system that is building the museum and not the museum that is building the narrative. And I think that amidst all the decisions that they have already been made, we should have a convergence of the community narrative um, in Bogota, also 
moving, expanding towards the territories and the need to have a national narrative built in Bogota. Uh, but right now that is silent, that is quiet. And it is the justice system that is actually building an actual narrative of the armed conflict for everyone. Thank you, Camilo. I think that is uh, an amazing uh, point to bring up here. Now you are raising the fact that we see some uh, different spaces in the spectrum of that conversation. At a certain point, we have um, discussions that were very important. We have the transitional justice system in Colombia led by the victims. The fact that the victims are at the center of the agreement is a result of all that mobilization effort, all the paths that they um, traveled along those 80 years of the conflict. But today we see an increasingly officialized discourse. It is not the official discourse, but we see some fragmentation and there is a lack of conversation. There are some fractures in that conversation and that is one of the toughest uh, challenges that we need to overcome. Luis Carlos, are you there? Hello, Diana. Good morning to you all. Undoubtedly, one of the most important challenges in Colombia has to do with the inability to um, recognize or to have long lasting historical remediation processes. We need to understand that Colombia was a victim of the indigenous genocide by the Spanish. We also have transatlantic migra migration processes um, from um, the African continent that uh, came to Colombia. And we also have victimization and violence cycles and processes and that are related to those processes where the white mestizo perspective uh, um, was given importance without recognizing that actually we come from an African indigenous origin, um, obviously mixed with the Spanish origin. This process uh, that Camilo, Nidia, and Italia have described deals with and the reappearance the, of the uh, historical reparation uh, commission. In Colombia, the, mu the, the process uh, with this museum has become an epidemic now. We need to come up with systemic measures in order to deal with the precarious conditions of museums. Right now, we are implementing methodologies and metaphors from medicine to do what we call uh, a museological triage or diagnosis uh, that is something that allows us to give priority to the museums that are at a higher risk of uh, disappearing or uh, that are on the verge of a crisis. The precarious condition of museums also relates to the fact that it is still a privilege of a class to have the right to truth, to history, and to memory. The right to aesthetic enjoyment or even the right to self-representation and to self-expression or to your own identity. Those rights are still um, given to a specific class. Uh, in Colombia, people have the right to access a library or to learn. That is why we do have laws for our archives and our libraries. But museums oftentimes are just spaces where um, power and exclusion dynamics are legitimized. And these are spaces that many sectors are not yet ready to share. That is why 
we need to go through an important pedagogical process to make sure that museums are custodians of uh, collections for the common good and that the services they offer are public and socially useful services. Therefore, we need to democratize the museological exercise. In that challenge of transforming the mindsets of decision makers and the elite groups, well, that challenge is a huge challenge that is, has been counsel, countered thanks to the agency of communities that have tried to engage in museological efforts in their own areas. So let me finish with this uh, thought. In Colombia, only 30% of museums are public. That means that 60% uh, of the civil society museums are not private museums. They belong to organizations and non-for-profit organizations. And they clearly understand that they have a social mission to fulfill. However, there are restrictions for investing publicly in these 60 museums. So, the government has not historically uh, given sufficient investments to museums because there is no policy on memory, on history, on museums. And at the same time, there is no clear path to strengthen civil society organizations that are now covering that gap where the state is not present. So I think that is one of the biggest challenges that the law on museums should uh, uh, feel that this law aims at establishing the framework, the legal framework for museums in Colombia, the general statutes uh, create the necessary organizations to uh, apply, to enforce that legal framework, and then to create a mixed fund for museological development in order to have a clearer funding for museum related activities. Thank you, Luis. Let me go back to the conversations that we have been having. We all have an understanding uh, of a museum, not just as a building, it goes beyond that idea of a collection and an exhibition. We see museums as public services, as tools for society and tools for social transformation. And that is more connected to our way of understanding long lasting memory and heritage. Can you all hear me because I got a message here? So that way of uh, understanding this connection between memory, heritage, and museum is uh, much broader and it allows us to um, contrast this extractivist uh, hegemonic perspective of museums. And that is a big challenge for us. Although communities have taken ownership of the museums, how can we make sure that museums are seen as tools at the service of society? So now that we are connecting memory, heritage, and museums, I would like to ask Jen and Anne what are the similarities that you observe in this kind of research and the ones that you have done in Syria, for instance? Jen or Anne? I think we're both being polite. <laughs> I, I'm just gonna start. Um, thank you so much, Diana. And I'm sorry, my connection was a bit, um, ropey at times, so I'm sorry if I, I missed anything. I was trying to follow in the um, AI. I think coming from the perspective of working in Syria, um, from the kind of safe distance of, of London, um, we're not post-conflict, um, and it's hard to imagine post-conflict. So um, 
we're in a for our our work uh, we're, we're concerned with a lot of the same issues about community memories and the challenges of um community engagement um sorry zoom wants me to confirm my language uh i'm gonna try to do that um in a in a context where we are working um not with the regime at all that is in power there so not in any way with official museums or national museums um so one of the challenges and i now see that it's a shared challenge that you have to is work is that our work is happening through civil society and through um ngos um including one called heritage for peace um which i think has a lot of objectives in common uh with the project that you're doing many projects that you're doing and i think one of the the challenges that we share is trying to enable those local voices and those spaces for dialogue um without the platform of official structures like museums right so we have this um and in a context where many of those people are already displaced um but nonetheless have have very strong links to um the communities that we're working with so i think so one of the things and i, and I won't talk about digital things because that's definitely and we'll have better things to say but i think one of the things that we're trying to do is thinking about how it might be possible to bring together those voices despite being dispersed literally and whether we can create platforms digitally to enable um those those kind of unified communities um i will say i was diana i was so jealous at the beginning and you were you were talking about um the way that you don't have a unified community of these museums but i think from from my perspective it seems very unified and you have such a wonderful network um so i i yeah um i think uh i'm just really inspired especially about um italia's comments about creating spaces for listening and for dialogues i think there's a um, there's a lot to think with there um but, but sorry Anne. Hi, I'm gonna uh, hope that I don't have feedback this time. It seems like seems like it's working okay. Um, just uh, echoing a lot of the things that that Jen so uh, nicely uh, laid out there. Um, uh, to build on the ideas about um, uh, digital possibilities, one of the things that our project is thinking about is. Uh, since we are working remotely and we are working with, um, you know, a remote dispersed community, maybe it opens up an opportunity to explore how uh, digital platforms, uh, new forms of technology allow us to um, collaboratively curate uh, things like photographs or uh, archival information associated with the, the, uh, the archaeological site that we're working on. Um, Sorry, I'm also getting a, a Zoom a prompt here. Just a moment. All right. Um, so in particular, uh, one of the, the platforms that we've been working with is called Wikidata, and uh, it's part of the Wikimedia community. It sits between, um, well, it is a, a kind of a grass, grassroots uh, organization where um, individuals uh, who are concerned with uh, well, who want to contribute to public knowledge bases uh, can work in this space and edit together. And uh, one of the things that that we find really valuable about that particular platform is that there's not a top-down narrative necessarily that uh, has to be enforced, uh, but maybe it becomes a space where we can put the top-down narrative uh, in conversation with uh, bottom-up uh, uh, perspectives, so uh, local community perspectives. So to be more specific, you know, think about a, uh, a photograph that many people could uh, add annotations to in their own native languages, uh, and uh, that those those annotations could live in a digital ecosystem together and uh, kind of um, uh, create a, a space for community collaborative uh, thinking together around uh, uh, um, documents or artifacts uh, 
of, of interest to many different groups, the, the kinds of things that could be uh, held in museum collections and, and uh, whatnot. So I, I'm interested to, to know whether you all are using uh, digital platforms and what kinds of digital platforms you, you've been using to, to try to reach your, uh, your um, uh, constituent stakeholders. Perhaps Camilo, Luis, Nidia, do you have any comment? All right. About the, um, the digital platforms that can create stronger connections with the communities and within the community itself, I'm very happy, uh, Jen, what you said, that we look like a strong community. That I really liked what you said, because actually we've made efforts to, to achieve that. And that's the, 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 the horizon that we have defined for us. Perhaps I didn't mention the context of uh, who we are. Huh? The Colombian Alliance for Museums is, as the name indicates, an alliance of joint efforts, efforts that come from academia, from the communities, even uh, government initiatives of individuals that have a large museum, a small museums, uh, a memory um, institute all kinds so that's the umbrella that protects us and it's the same analogy for the law it, a law that acts as an umbrella that can uh, give us that can give us shade and favors our progress towards that horizon so the alliance becomes precisely a collaborative effort to strengthen that community and precisely this webinar has been the, the perfect moment because the Alliance together with the uh, museum strengthening uh, project led by Juan Carlos and the National Museum and the program of Museums for Peace at the University of Los Andes are launching a repository to answer a very, very simple questions, who we are, where we are and how we can be stronger. And that's one of the most difficult questions in the sector. In general, in the conversations among those of us who work with museums, there's a range between 100, 300, 600 uh, museum initiatives. And that huge gap we have of knowing who we are actually and who recognize themselves and how we recognize ourselves as a strengthened community, that's an exercise we should uh, conduct. So this webinar has been part of the conversation that leads us to these reflections about museums as tools for social transformation, but it's also an invitation to join this community. And it's a community that has the, their open arms and is not trying the museum to have just four walls, a collection, a catalog, but that self recognizes itself. And that's part of the process of knowing who we are. I see Italia that is not in. I, I would like to know what she thinks about it. Yeah, I was listening very carefully. And of course, I fully agree with uh, everything that was mentioned. Perhaps I would just like to mention two elements. One, as part of this system of truth, justice, reparation and non-repetition, that, that is the institutional framework that comes out of the result of the peace negotiations between the government and the FARC. These three pillars that Diana mentioned are not de facto or in paper. They are not connecting memory or the role of the citizen's voice despite the centrality of the victims in the agreements. Such... Um, that is such a serious, uh, excuse me if my dog is here, that's such a critical aspect that at the National Center for Historical Memory, that is the entity that leads the, the, the creation of the Museum for the Memory, in a post-conflict area, that has become like the 
treasure and all the agendas, all the resources are there, and but there's no result that shows that effective participation of the voices of memory of the conflict in our country. That means that when the territorial initiatives, as Camilo mentioned, start to push for participating actively in that public space, in that public uh, area to share their stories, their voice is not limited to a testimonial voice. That's what transitional justice is for. But they do it rather from a political voice. But that political voice is not heard. So it's assumed that there are 9 million victims and from the government and those that thought of the system think that those voices are voices that only speak about facts of the conflict, but not what happened in the territories before, how the war started in those territories and how the communities resisted that violence and what alternatives they have built to overcome those violences. The absence of that political voice explains that the initiatives from memory and many initiatives at museums are only uh, almost, and this is sad, but they're almost clearly restricted to funding those processes that are concentrated in the processes of uh, exhibition, the construction of, uh, of facilities and hiring personnel and promotion. That's all very good and it's welcome, but the perverse effect is the silencing of that political voice that was capable, capable of challenging reality and violence and that also silence is something that we do have at the territories that is the experience in the construction of alternatives to overcome violences to open roads for reconciliation and to promote scenarios of non-repetition and that is in essence the mission of the comprehensive system of truth justice reparation and non-repetition so in all that context of violence in the country well, this force appears, this Colombian Alliance for Museums that um, asks questions about these issues and needs to find immediate solutions, particularly during the pandemic where many museums were closed and they're even in crisis today. And that leads us to a road of political advocacy. Political advocacy understood as let's ask those questions to the sectors that will be in power. Let's ask those questions and let us sit with them together to build a road ahead. However, even today, and despite the progress made, we can see that one of the biggest challenges is to overcome that historical harm of the citizen perception about the mission or role of museums. Museums are places of dialogue. And I repeat this concept because the spaces for political debate where the realities are solved, where the problems are identified and where solutions are found that's limited to the political actors that are elected by the people or by the mafia are clans in the territories but the popular voice is still silenced and we need to make those voices elevate and recover their political space in the search for alternatives in our country and there we do believe as a museum, but also as an alliance, because that's the work that we've been doing in the past five or six years, is that we have to recover museums as political spaces for strengthening democracy, for citizen exercise. And there we have a huge task ahead. The law precisely that we are formulating pushes to obtain that space there. It wants that space there, but once we have it, once we have expressed it in paper, the big challenge will be 
how can we make those that are in in Congress that have a decision making power understand all these dynamics? How do we make them respect this process and share it and promote it and support it and embrace it? And how do we make society as a whole, society that saw violence on TV, understand that the space for a museum in a small town or the National Museum is their home, their home to talk about what we were forbidden to talk about, to listen because we're afraid of listening to the truth, to sit and speak, although there are deep hatred for the damage, of, that's one of the, the damages of the war, hatred, distrust, but we need to do it. And this will not come out from the establishment or from the elites of the mafia power or the political power that are elected by the people. This has to come out of the citizens. And there, I feel that museums teach, uh, Professor Nidia, I think we have this task ahead. And there's no museum for memory because it's a loot. And so they are fighting for the loot. And the loot in, in one of those struggles was destroyed and fell in the center of Bogota and it's falling to pieces. That's the disaster of not having a policy for memory. Now, I do pose this challenge to you and this is the end, Diana, I see your face. The law for museums should contemplate, and this has been part of the debates that we have, it should contemplate memory as a substantial area to deep for regulation and for deployment. Memory and museums are connected, vitally connected. Even more if we believe in museums for peace and even more if we want to make museums the citizen agoras to do what others are never going to do. And we do have the experience and the ability and the will and also the awareness and the responsibility that that imposes. As we do have at, uh, that at museums and the processes and the policies for memory in all the territories in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ita. Camilo, let me go back to what Italia said, but going back to the comment on digital media to get there. I think that the digital aspect is a field where I have actively participated in museums. And overall, museums in general and museums of memory and on armed conflicts see this as spaces where the process is disseminated, but not where the process is built. So, participation as part of an, an activation process. This is permission to third parties. I give you this uh, digital product, you just have to apply it to this space. But actually, it has not been a well thought exercise. And that is the origin of several problems. In Colombia, this um, it is not easy and it is quite complicated for an organization in Colombia to maintain a website. And it, is, it doesn't make so much sense and there is not the ability to understand technically what it implies to do hosting, to maintain a site, to keep it open. And then we also see significant repercussions. For instance, today, the public digital archive of what was going to be the Museum of the Truth Commission is not in Colombia. This was given to the Crop Institute in the United States, and they are the ones who are going to manage uh, perpetually the legacy of the Truth Commission with all its implications. You have this that is from a territorial standpoint quite distant from Colombia, the, it will have the U.S. perspective. It can be well-intentioned, but nevertheless, it doesn't grasp deeply the impact of uh, being or not being in the territory. So this is another debt that we create, not the only one, but another one. 
with all the institutions that we have been having a dialogue and social participation, we see that now they fear to open a space for participation. They try to open a small space, not a big one, because they are afraid of what may happen. And that is a symptom as the government has not been able to create sufficient spaces. And whenever there is a space, the communities and the territories have to get there to say, we are not here just for this. We want to do all these other things as well, because there is no other way, uh, space to do this. So it is there where I believe that museums have to become constituents. They have to be spaces where society is built, where we can establish the constitution of how to feel, how to live, how to dream. Our role is to make sure that that happens, is to set up spaces where people do not just go and see a presentation on the world through different pieces and the story that we want to tell in that space, but also how that story is an invitation to build meanings uh, of community. This is what we have been doing in the Alliance and also in the National Museum, we are working to strengthen museums in this way. But I think that that is an important challenge. How can we transform these giant institutions? They are always in Bogota. How can we make sure that these spaces are seen as spaces where people can actively participate and where they can demand a space for constitution of the Colombian society. Thank you, Camilo. And you raise your hand, right? I did. Uh, thank you. I have uh, so many uh, ideas now after uh, Camilo uh, uh, gave that uh, wonderful commentary. Um, but the first thing that I am wondering about is uh, the fear of retribution that uh, folks in in your local communities might have uh, in speaking truth to to power and uh, speaking against the the more centralized narratives. And I wonder if you could give me a little more context about uh, whether there is danger for the individuals that that might have different perspectives uh, that that weigh into uh, these museum collections. Who would like to address that question? I think that I can give you a very small example. Perhaps it will not answer your question entirely, but in the process of putting together the law, we have been talking with different uh, points of reference in the museological field. And what happened to us is that um, we said, well, the law is going to establish rules for returning the collections of museums to indigenous groups. Is, is it going to do that? That is a difficult question to answer. As a nation, we have fallen victim of the looting of collections that collections that were taken to other countries, and we have not been able to answer that question. So the question is now, now as an archeology span um, museum, as a national museum, as the museum of a municipality, where you have seen that behavior, what are you going to do? Are you going to bring back those pieces? Or are you going to put that into the law? Or are you going to do just the opposite? So this is what we see underlying this participation exercise. These are just examples. These are quite complicated questions. And when you see an official in power, um, these officials can run into trouble with these questions. So this is what has been happening. They try to look the other way or to close participation spaces. I have no answer how we can change that, but the political position that we should take is that we cannot turn a blind eye to that. We 
need to find answers to those questions uh, posed by citizens and have an institutionalistic registry or a territorial registry and work on a daily basis to search for those answers because we don't find those answers in a manual. If I misunderstood the question, but Anne was talking about the fear of retribution and the fear of retaliation perhaps, And then something interesting happened in Colombia, where at the starting point of legacy and memory or heritage and memory, you see the role of the museum and the strategic use of memory. And as Italia said, the memory has turned into a booty, into a loot. So in understanding certain types of memory or certain uses of memory, there are multiple positions, positions that adopt memory as an avant-garde strategy, as a collective strategy, a dialogue-based strategy. But in other cases, you cannot just talk about memory. Memory does not is not included in the discussion because um, that is politicized and it is associated with the peace agreement, with the insurgents, counterinsurgents, with the loot. So yes, there is fear of retribution and there are concrete cases of retribution, retaliation, but that doesn't mean that um, that is a unified position. There is a heterogeneous situation and it is a matter of defining the limits for memory, heritage and the different uses of those elements. Uh, where does this take us to? How, what are the tensions created uh, here? How can we use this at, uh, for our own? Uh, purpose. And let me wrap up a little bit because I'm, we are just left with 15 minutes. Oh, Luis is asking for the floor. Hello, Diana. Let me take this opportunity after the previous speakers who talked about digital materials and retaliation to make a statement and try to rebuild this. I think that the methodological seal of uh, museology in Colombia is characterized by the learning of the agency by the survivors of the armed conflict in Colombia. The Colombian museologists make a big effort in every sphere, in the digital sphere, in curatorship, in uh, assembling the collections by learning or uh, trying to answer to that joint responsibility, following the example of the victims through agency. Every museologist in Colombia uh, is a protector of the heritage, of the work, of the territory. And there is also a dynamics of fear that takes place among ourselves. I'm not surprised, but I'm pleased uh, to hear that uh, we are like a retony. There are three sectorial spaces. We have the Colombian Alliance of Museums. We have the uh, strengthening program that is the institutional program. And then we have the Colombian, com in the International Committee of Museums. And it is easy to get together Join forces uh, to engage in collective in joint action, like when we were at the best uh, point in the crisis, where with the where there were a lot of killings, a lot of violence in the framework of a national strike, and at that time, museums went on strike at the international level. We received support from all over the world for that action. Now by listening to you, I have the feeling that we can also do the same to promote a strike uh, in the face of the genocide in Palestine. 
We received support from Mexico, from Europe, several museums uh, joined that strike. And I think that it will be difficult to get that voice from Europe. So perhaps we can promote that strike from us, uh, from here, or perhaps the Alliance can do that. And then with this methodological seal, museums have to become places of protection, of safeguarding, places where we can have difficult conversations without jeopardizing our lives. But also museums uh, learn survival tactics or they identify in children's workshops, uh, you can identify the armed uh, sectors uh, that are around us and you learn how to protect yourself from that and you convey that knowledge on how to survive in a situation of conflict. Museums have been warehouses uh, of knowledge in times of uh, pandemic and these are spaces that because of their own employees have turned into spaces for building peace in a different way at all times. And I think that that is what makes us feel that we don't know where we are talking from when we make a statement. Uh, even if you are in, we are in the hat of an activist or of the institutional representative of the museum because care for the country and for the memory transcends us, goes beyond us as individuals because it is related to a demand from the territory and from our ancestors. So, uh, um, we have this antecedent and sorry for now talking about the ethnic uh, component, but this is the mandate of the mother, of the father, and I think that that uh, needs to be taken into account. Thank you. I just wanted to close by saying or by sharing a perspective of a, an old museol museologist. Museums are a cultural institution and 200 years is not a lot for an institution that is there to preserve the memory, almost to work with eternity. So the conflict of museums all over the place since I studied is how to achieve that objective, that is to open the contents of the collections that exist since man exists, and opening that in that enthusiasm of illustration for the people to enjoy it. So I was thinking these days, last year, I wanted to do some research about that. And I thought perhaps what happens is that we, we still don't know what is a museum and what is people, but in Colombia, all the things that have been discussed here have forced us to land it. And now we know what memory is. We know what's the meaning of the politicization of our work, because it's essentially a political work. That, that's what Diana defends so enthusiastically. And what I would like to say in closing is that these problems of the theory of museology are there. I mean, the museums have not been able in general to meet their objective. But in Colombia, as in Syria, the reality is so harsh and there are so many possibilities for doing things that we play a role that is more focused. That's why we've managed for the very small alliance to achieve so important things in such a short period of time. That's why it has such a huge potential. That's why a session like this is so meaningful because reality doesn't allow us to do so much theory. We have to work things out. So the problem of the museum for memory has to be solved. We have to do whatever it takes, but it, it can't keep being a waste of money in a country that is distracted with that when we're losing focus of what we were supposed to be talking. So what I would like to say is it is an old problem for museums, but we are in such a difficult situation that it has forced us to be a little better 
that's uh, quite optimistic. And having so many young museologists, I think that we are going for the better. That's what I wanted to share. I'm happy we ended on a happy note because at the beginning, I, I, I thought this is going to be so sad. So we just have eight minutes left for this seminar. So I would like to know if anybody from the public would like to share anything. Perhaps they can write in the chat. Oh, Soraya has raised her hand. Where are you? How much enthusiasm, love, passion, knowledge of reality, knowing that we have to transform reality, as Nidia said, and everybody here, I really liked what she said. The old things about the illustration and 200 things. Okay, let's them, let them do that. But memory, the memory is alive. And behind the armed conflicts and this craziness of injustice and the, the fights in the territories, well, these small actions and these small victories we have in this Colombian Alliance for Museums to start building a new narrative. Museums on the floor, not in a big statue with the big heroes and, and not having other countries talk about your memory. I was very touched at what Camilo Murcia uh, shared today so clearly that our archives for memory are outside the country, even if there's goodwill behind that. That belongs to us. And now amid the conflict, there's still lots of silence imposed, many voluntary silence as well. So we should be very bold and creative to start building those strategies. And I think one essential aspect is pedagogy, that citizen pedagogy, peda pedagogy for peace, for taking ownership of the rights of communities, but also for that dialogue between public officials, museum workers, and us, civil society, organized civil society, can think that a public policy cannot be under the power of a presidential decree, but there has to be a law. And the law has to be a law for museums that contains all the things we intended to have and a law for memory because we need that. So each fragment of this, each action that is carried out is legitimate or legal. So legality gives strength to what we do as we have been insisting. Civil society needs to push for that law and that's for us. We cannot just sit and think of not being self-critical first and then with that criticism we can tell the government and these public officials that they are there temporarily. They are there for four years. And that's my concern. If today we have Camilo, we have Luis Manjares in the Colombian government with the current administration, when this administration leaves and a new administration comes, if we have no law, then our friends will be gone. So that's where I would like to focus. That chair of museology at the National University, that is our public university, because we have a right to education, they should open cohorts in the territories. In the Caribbean, for instance, now we have a branch of the National University here in the Caribbean, in La Paz, at the University of La Paz, for hours from the territory. All these people from the Colombian Caribbean can do what you've learned also in Bogota from the wonderful chair where Professor Nidia uh, shares her knowledge. So I think we have to be specific. And what she said was fantastic. 
that's why, well, Nivea is so wise. We have to move from theory to practice. And this practice, I think that with mystic, with love, with passion, and without distractions. So I, that's why I like this. And I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces that are engaged against all odds. Despite the lack of trust we still have in government institutions, we have to work and see how, through these dialogues proposed by Luis and Camilo, how we can sit at the table again to listen to them as well and for them to listen to us. That's my contribution this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Soraya. Again, I'm happy that this conversation has ended with an optimistic and happy note and rather solid. I think it's a word that works to describe what we need, what we want, the horizon we want. I think Camilo, Luis, Nidia, Italia, and Jen, for your effort, for joining us, and all our guests for staying with us for an hour and a half. It seems like 100 people have been connected here today. So we are very happy with this conversation. And we also thank Erin, Catherine, Christina for their support in the organization of this space. And I think that this has been recorded and in a couple of weeks, the link will be available and we'll be sharing it to you again. Thank you all for your reflections, for your engagement. And I would like to share a final reflection about the dignity of life and the care of life that is around these initiatives. I'm not sure what the next step should be, Erin. I just want to thank everybody for um, an amazing event this morning. And I did want to, I did put in the chat um, our next session, which is on uh, February 28th, and invite you to um, to join us for that session and continue um, the conversation uh, that was started here today. And I just want to um, thank you all for your time and your energy um, and the application of theory to practice and continuing to wrestle with these very um, important um, and overwhelming um, questions. Um, so thank you all very much. And um, we hope that the rest of you can join us again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you all.